All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from uh, the break, and thank you for joining us for the afternoon session at our Warfighter Summit and Exposition. Uh, our next uh, CMF is titled Innovation at the Edge, and uh, General uh, Anderson needs no introduction. He is the chairman of the North Carolina Military Affairs Commission. I'm going to turn it right over to you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All the way. Thank you very much for uh, being here this afternoon. Uh, I realize that it's after lunch, and so you're going to need some special motivation throughout. And so when I say um, all the way, you respond with airborne. Okay, so let's try it out. All the way. Airborne. Oh, they have to hear you on the other side. All the way. Airborne. I am Major General Retired Rodney Anderson, and I am a soldier and paratrooper for life, and it's my distinct honor to moderate this panel. Today, the panel's name is descriptive of the very important mission that we're going to hear about. Innovation at the Edge, Outloading America's Contingency Corps. The recent history includes a NEO in Afghanistan, the Ukrainian assistance mission, two very important missions most recently. These missions highlight the importance of a contingency corps and of outloading, innovation, the importance of data, and the tools needed to operate successfully in today's environment. Today's panel brings direct knowledge and expertise in understanding these topics. Our panelists will provide their unclassified insights regarding outload and the elements associated with a successful outload. One of the overall lessons is the importance of data and data uh, is and data's impact in, in outload. So you'll hear about that. All right, let's have a roll call of those in attendance. Raise your hand if you're if you're active duty on Fort Bragg. Okay, very well. Uh, any National Guard? Any guardsmen? Reservists? Um, raise your hand if you're deployed to Europe in support of uh, the Russian aggression. Okay, very well. Any joint partners in here? Raise your hand if you're a joint partner. Veterans? Veterans? Awesome, awesome. We got a manifest of veterans. <laughs> Okay, so today's panel is the discussion on a range of topics that include the strategic role of 18th Airborne Corps in Fort Bragg, the importance of being a part of a learning organization, data centrality enabling speed and combat power generation, expedited versus deliberate deployment, and the importance of joint partner relationships. Let's begin with panel uh, introductions, and so I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves and give uh, a brief uh, summary of uh, relevant to this panel. Now, panelists. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll lead off. So I'm Brigadier General John Cogbill. I'm the Chief of Staff of the 18th Airborne Corps. I'm a three-time uh, uh, offender to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, so my very first duty assignment was here in the 82nd Airborne and first at 325 under then Lieutenant Colonel Dan Allen as our, our battalion commander. Uh, so I got off on, a, on the right foot uh, as a young lieutenant and then uh, wasn't able to come back until I was the Chief of Staff of Joint Special Operations Command. So I had a bunch of <laughs> airborne and ranger assignments uh, in between those, uh, to, as well as a tour uh, teaching at the United States Military Academy. So I came back as the JSOC Chief of Staff. Uh, from there, uh, went back to the 101st Airborne Division to be a Deputy Commanding General uh, for Operations. Uh, for about a year and then got called back uh, once again to the center of the military universe to be General Carrillo's chief of staff. And I've been doing this for about 18 months uh, and just really, uh, it's an exciting place to be. Uh, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to, to sit with this distinguished panel and talk about innovation and, and data and all the great things that are, that are going on right now. It's just a passion of mine and uh, it's great to be a part of it. Thank you. Sir, I am uh, Command Sergeant Major T.J. Holland, 18 Airborne Corps and Fort Bragg Command Sergeant Major. Uh, I started off as a young paratrooper in the 82nd in the 504 and found myself lucky and fortunate enough to become the Corps Sergeant Major 
uh, full circle. Started a paratrooper and now finishing up my tenure in Fort Bragg as a paratrooper, uh, as a Corps Sergeant Major. A um, couple roles that I, that I am responsible for, obviously, is being a Corps Command Sergeant Major, the senior enlisted leader for, for all of the soldiers in that Corps, but additionally, the, the senior command of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and a willing partner and enabling partner to our great five county region and great partners in Fayetteville, Spring Lake area. Additionally, we have uh, additional roles as the uh, Earth Surf Coordinating Headquarters for all our downtrace units, which we'll get into a little bit today. And we find our roles as far as being uh, airborne leaders in the Army's Airborne Board, so I'm the senior enlisted leader in the Army's Airborne Board, and in the commanding general of the 18th Airborne Corps himself and the senior leaders of the Corps, we run the Infantry Warfighter Symposium on a quarterly basis. So everything we're going to talk about today, we ensure that all those lessons learned, all those things we're trying to do as far as leading the Army and data centricity, uh, we proliferate across all those platforms for the Army. Cool. Airborne and air assault. And uh, never been assigned here at uh, Fort Bragg, but definitely been in the 18th Airborne Corps. Uh, six total years through my career uh, with the 101st. And uh, yeah, I'm currently the operations officer, G3, for Army Material Command. And that is really the primary logistics command for the Army. Um, operate globally um, about 190,000 you know, employees, well, military, civilian, and contracted. And uh, we provide uh, really, uh, you know, um, logistics uh, worldwide. We uh, run the global supply chain, uh, the organic industrial base. Um, you know, maintenance and readiness is in our space. Uh, and we, um, you know, do this through our arsenals, our plants, our depots, and, and really being able to see ourselves to support the 18th Airborne Corps you know, from in our sequence, from the strategic support area here in CONUS, all the way to the edge in any theater. And so it's an honor to be part of the panel. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jared Summers. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer of the 18th Airborne Corps. Um, recently just uh, came back to public service from spending the last decade uh, driving digital transformation for a, a Fortune 5 company uh, by the name of ExxonMobil, you know, a small little startup in Houston, Texas. Um, so a lot of similarities, large geographically dispersed uh, organization with a, a diverse role. And uh, if you know anything about oil and gas, um, you know, exploration is usually in relatively unimproved areas. So you have to bring absolutely everything you need with you, uh, much like we do when, uh, when we go through uh, the deployment we're going to talk about later today. So responsibilities include driving digital transformation for the core, uh, innovation, technology, insertion, uh, and other really, really fun, exciting things. So excited to be here uh, and looking forward to, to this opportunity. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lieutenant Colonel C.J. Burden. I'm the commander of the 43rd Operations Support Squadron at Pope Army Airfield here at Fort Bragg. I'm honored to be a representative of the 43rd Air Mobility Operations Group here. And as the unit that projects the force, runs the airfield, and develops our joint warfighting partners here at Fort Bragg, we really play an outsized role when the force needs to be called up to go out the door. Um, the responsibilities that the 43rd AMOG has in terms of projecting the force, immediate response force, national mission force, and our other partners include making sure that we tie in with Air Mobility Command Headquarters and Transcom to make sure that airlift is allocated, assigned correctly, and flows downrange the way we need it to for task organization for our warfighting partners. It's an honor to be here today. Appreciate the time. All the way. <laughs> oh, come on now. Pay attention. All the way. <laughs> okay, let's get this kicked off with a discussion of the strategic role of 18th Airborne Corps and Fort Bragg. Sir? All right. Thank you, sir. All right. I think uh, as America's contingency corps, uh, we understand the strategic significance of not only the 18th Airborne Corps, but Fort Bragg. And that's the reason we're doing an AUSA panel. I've never heard of doing one outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, but doing this entire event here is, is historic, and I think it's appropriate just based off the importance of Fort Bragg to not only the United States Army, but to the Joint Force. Uh, and, you know, we, we, as America's Contingency Corps, uh, you know, when the President dials 911, the phone rings right here at Fort Bragg. And it's not just the Corps that answers that call. Uh, it's also U.S. Army Special Operations Command. It's the Joint Special Operations Command. It's our SFAB, our SFAC headquarters. So uh, there's so much combat power and capability situated right here 
in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, it's, and it, it's just a, it's, it's an exciting place to serve. Um, so not only do we, it, is it who we are, it's where we are. So the, the Fort Bragg as an installation connected to Pope Army Airfield uh, gives us that ability to be a true strategic power projection platform. Uh, because when, when we do get that 911 call, uh, our nation expects us to get there in a hurry. And that's one of the things that makes us different from the other corps in the Army, uh, not only in terms of capability, but that joint forcible entry capability, but the timeline in which we can do that. And, and part of that is a con contractual obligation that we have to the Secretary of Defense as the immediate response force and as a contingency response force to be ready to, to, to deploy on no notice uh, and to you know, deploy, fight, and win. So uh, the IRF, the Immediate Response Force, is a, it has a timeline. So the, it's an entire BCT. So right now it's a, it's a brigade combat team from the 82nd, and they're responsible to be out the door in 96 hours. Inside of that, that's the entire brigade. Then you've got a battalion, uh, the IRB, which is on a 48-hour string, um, but that can be accelerated by the chairman to 18 hours. And for most people, I don't know if it's just because we're the 18th Airborne Corps, but 18 hours is synonymous with our deployments because that's kind of what people expect. And that's what we've been able to deliver. Uh, but the contract is for 48 hours. And then you've got a, a uh, to have redundancy, you've got the IRF-2, which is uh, another BCT. So that when IRF-1 goes out the door, IRF-2 becomes the IRF-1. And so they have to be in a very high state of readiness uh, in terms of personnel, their equipment, uh, their training and everything else. Uh, to, to, you know, when the, the, the phone, I would say the beeper, but when you get that phone call in the middle of the night, you're rolling in uh, and you're, you're heading down to green ramp and you've got to be ready. Your bags have got to be packed. And that's just a mentality and that's a culture that exists uh, in the 18th Airborne Corps and really all the units at Fort Bragg. It, and, and it's been tested time and time again. So that, that's kind of, uh, you know, the, the requirement. That's our contract and that's our obligation to our nation to be ready when they call. Uh, to go anywhere, and, and this is, you know, it's not just, we're not a regional force. Uh, we have, we are part of 10 different O plans uh, across all the global combatant commands. And so we have to be ready to go anywhere, whether that's Europe, whether that's the Pacific, uh, like I said, anywhere in the world on, on short notice. And what, you know, what we provide, as I mentioned, was the joint forcible entry capability. So we can, you know, conduct a parachute assault. We can do an air assault. Uh, we have two JFE divisions in terms of the, you know, the 82nd, you got the 101st, you got a, an armored division in 3rd ID, and then you've got in a, uh, the 10th Mountain Division, an Alpine division, capable of fighting in extreme uh, cold weather. In addition to that, we've got seven separate brigades which provide a bunch of different capabilities. So we've got uh, an, an intelligence brigade, expeditionary signal brigade, uh, a, the 7th TBX, which provides over the shore logistics, uh, with a bunch of watercraft down in, in Virginia. Um, we've got, uh, what am I leaving out? The, we've got a fires brigade, so we've got high Mars. Uh, we've got an engineer brigade, so uh, the, the ability to bring wet gap crossings. Uh, and, and so that's, I think I've covered them all, but that's a lot of different capability inside of one headquarters. And so these are tailorable and scalable packages that we can provide the joint force. Um, in, in addition to that is, I think, as a headquarters, uh, which we have done time and time again is be the nucleus for that joint task force, that JTF, uh, to, to provide that, that mission command for an operation and, and to be able to set up a expeditionary mission command uh, under any conditions in a LISCO environment and, and be able to see to the fight. So you've got the core that has that capability. Uh, and so we're planted at N plus six. And we talk about timelines, we're always on a timeline. We're stood up in the DJOC when we get the word. Uh, we've got situational awareness and we're communicating uh, all the way up, you know, uh, to the Geographic Combatant Command, up to the Joint Staff as required. Uh, but we've got that capability at N plus six, where we can provide attack at N plus 48, and then uh, the rest of the headquarters uh, has to be prepared to be on the ground at, at N plus 96 hours. So that's just kind of the lifestyle that we live, and that's the culture of readiness that pervades uh, 18th Airborne Corps in Fort Bragg. Thanks. Yes, sir. Tom Major? Uh, thank you, sir. And, you know, kind of building off that I meet your response force, continues your response force uh, responsibility. And you think about uh, in context of my role as a senior enlisted leader in the Corps, uh, we're absolutely laser focused on b delivering the capability that the, the, the geographical combatant commander needs, the requirement, right? So we're building readiness, we're training to a readiness level that, that is required to, to enable the joint force to fight and win tonight. Uh, to the left of that, I, I think in terms of the Earth Surf 
coordinating headquarters for all our downtrace organizations that are ready to do that, to, to, to be on the ground in 96 hours, to be able to get, leave Fort Bragg in 18 hours, some of those responsibilities. You know, we want to make sure we have the, t the right talent in those formations that can go and fight and win, right? And a lot of that is working with the, the uh, active component manning guidance to make sure that those brigades and those downtrace units, whether they're in the, the separates like the chief of staff mentioned, that, that those right leaders and the right skills and the right grade traits are in place and are trained and lethal and they're ready to deploy. Uh, additionally, you know, we're working with uh, the Army as well and Forces Command. We're going to do the Army Manning Synchronization Conference next month, and we're going to talk about what, what that means in, in context of rearm, right? To, to have the Earth surf, uh, not just in the 18 Airborne Corps, but across the Army, because there's other surf units outside the 18 Airborne Corps, the right level of readiness to, to deliver that at a moment's notice. Um, and that's all supporting on the, on the directed readiness tables, right? We, we have to deliver the right level. And then as far as that, I talked about tanning, uh, talent management and the manning, there's the equipment course, and I'm glad General Fogg, you're here with us today. We couldn't do this without the AMC, right? Because we've got to make sure before the deployment, our soldiers have the right equipment to fight and survive. We're responsible for the whole globe. We have to be ready to go anywhere, whether that's the Indo-PACOM region, the CENTCOM region, or the Yukon region. And we've got to make sure we have the right equipment for the soldiers to be able to survive and thrive in those environments. And we've gotten that time and time again because of our AMC partners making sure that we had what we need to, to deploy tonight. Um, and then we got to work with the Geographical Combatant Command because once we're on the ground, uh, in this case, when you think about uh, whether it was HKIA, and as in the last two years of the Corps Sergeant Major, that's the second time in the Earth and, and as, as a Corps Sergeant Major that has been deployed to CENTCOM AOR. Or this time in Yukon, which is the first time the 18 Airborne Corps has been on the European continent since World War II in a crisis, right? With that, the, the business rules involved, we're paying entitlements, we're making sure we're fighting for every day, for every soldier, airman, marine, coast guard, whoever's part of the joint force to make sure that the appropriate pay and entitlements, make sure that soldier's family is taken care of back home. And that's really when I look at uh, the responsibility of my, my role in that. And additionally, no soldier can fight and win and deploy within 18 hours from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, regardless of how good we are as the Army and the Joint Forces premier power projection platform without a world-class community. That five counter region, that Fayetteville community, that Spring Lake community, 77% of our soldiers and families live in those communities. We're, we are part of those communities. Our soldiers couldn't fight and win if they did not think that their, their families are being taken care of, that the schools weren't there to, to, to educate their, their children, if their, their spouses are having jobs and they're taking care of and everything is involved uh, as far as helping us be successful uh, wherever we are in the globe, it, it all starts and ends with right here at Fort Bragg with our communities. Sir. Thanks, Thanks. Major. And so no I would add to this that those very critical and short timelines cannot be met unless your soldiers are ready, as you talked about, uh, Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major, the equipment is ready and the installation is ready. The installation is ready to support, and of course with AMC's MCOM headquarters, uh, the infrastructure to push out the force. You know, our uh, LCMCs, our major subordinate commands that do uh, class nine repair parts and maintenance have to be uh, in the fight with you to have your equipment ready to, before you deploy, uh, and we absolutely are. Um, so that readiness is absolutely critical. We've gotta be able to anticipate requirements uh, those logistics requirements, equipment, support to soldiers, uh, investing in the infrastructure so we have the right power projection capability here at Fort Bragg. And, and that is AMC's role uh, in uh, making sure that this contingency corps can execute the mission uh, that it's been given. And so your garrison commander here is synchronizing those efforts. Your AFSB uh, commander is synchronizing those efforts here. And when the in-hour sequence starts, we're right there with you. Uh, when you uh, went to support uh, the Ukrainians, uh, the uh, AMC headquarters, the commander pushed an LO, uh, LNO into your headquarters, you know, the next day. Um, when you're executing your in-hour sequence, we have our logistic support elements um, that are going to deploy with you, and they're right there supporting you all along the way. And they're forward. We're forward with contracting capability. We're forward with the maintenance capability. We're, we're pushing you ammo uh, to make sure that we enable all the capabilities to be able to fight as soon as you hit the ground. And so that's, that's AMC's responsibility and kind of strategic role. Very well, all the way. Airborne. 
You've heard a good overview of the 18th Airborne Corps and the uh, breadth and depth of the units and, and the importance of the mission. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the importance of being a uh, learning organization as we transform for the future. All right, I'll lead off with that, sir. Uh, so, I mean, whether it's in the military or in business, if you're not learning, you're failing. Um, and in our line of work, you're, you're dying. So you have to continue to evolve and you have to continue to learn, especially to, to, to be prepared to not only survive on the modern battlefield, but dominate the modern battlefield. And so that's, uh, that's why you know, I've, I've, I'm, I've spanned two Corps commanders, General Carrillo and now General Donahue, and both of them told, told me as their chief of staff and told the rest of uh, the Corps that we will be a data, a data-centric organization, a, a data-enabled Corps. Uh, and, and for a lot of people who are like, what does that mean? Uh, you know, you know and, and to him, very simply, it means you have to have decision dominance over your adversaries. Commanders need to have uh, the best possible situational awareness that they could have, and then they need to be able to make decisions faster than our adversaries. In order to do that, you need data. So you've heard of John Boyd, Colonel John Boyd, uh, Air Force Colonel, uh, who came up with the OODA loop, the uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. And he was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, and that was, in his observation, uh, one from, from doing you know, air-to-air combat, but also looking at kind of the records of the best fighter pilots, those that could complete and execute that OODA loop the fastest survived, and those that couldn't died. And so the same is, you know, if you look at the modern battlefield uh, with the proliferation of technologies and our you know, capabilities of our, uh, the near-peer adversaries uh, and, and what they're doing in a joint, combined, contested, multi-domain environment, uh, we have to be able to do that better than anybody else. And in order to do that, we have to have, uh, we have to understand data. And, and that's where, that, you know, we are not, the people on this panel are not digital natives. Uh, data isn't um, it, something that uh, just jumps out at you and you understand really, you know, how to manage it, uh, how to transport, how to uh, uh, manipulate it and, and make it useful. So we all have to learn, and so that, that's about people, and that's about upskilling the force from the top down. So you, know, you have to have leaders that are making data-driven data decisions, and you have to have people in the ranks that are capable of, of coding and of writing algorithms and of sorting data and cleaning data and making it useful and accessible uh, and that we can actually do things with it. So, uh, you know, as we, as there's an upskill piece of this, and I think Sergeant Major will hit on that a little bit more. Uh, but one of the things we've had to do is just to kind of get people involved and, you know, uh, out of their normal duties and responsibilities is kind of create a culture of innovation inside the core. And how do you do that? How do you get people excited about innovation? Well, it's, it's really just about empowering people. It's about, you know, giving, um, you know, mission orders to subordinates and letting them execute discipline initiative and then empowering those agile and adaptive leaders to go out and accomplish a mission. And what we found is that those closest to the problem tend to have the best solutions. Uh, and as I look around the audience right now, I see people from the 101st Airborne Division like Sergeant Harp and others, uh, Captain Lauren Hansen, who, uh, who took that and ran with it because that's all they were waiting for was the opportunity to go out and, and solve problems, not be problem identifiers, but be problem solvers. And so there's, there's different ways that we go about this. There's kind of the you know, more broadly, just pulling people in and getting them exposed in, in competitions like the Dragon's Lair, which is like a Shark Tank event where they bring their ideas in, they present it to a panel, and then they're incentivized to do this. One, uh, by the, just the, the, the FaceTime with the Corps Commander and, and Sergeant Major and the other members of the panel, but there's other incentives involved in terms of they get their project taken on with the, the full backing of the Corps, they get a four-day pass, they get school of choice, et cetera. So it's a great way to just get people into the game and then once we identify the people that are the natural innovators, the MacGyvers and the crew, then how do you give them the skills that they need to enable a data-centric organization? So coding classes, uh, you know, fellowships, partnerships, internships, et cetera. And then we bring them back and we put them to work at the edge, kind of like the, the title of this symposium. So we get them out there on the edge solving problems, whether that's in Europe, whether that's here at Fort Bragg, or are solving problems with joint interoperability that will enable our mission anywhere in the world. And so we'll talk more about this as we get into data centricity, but that learning organization, at the, the, I think our comparative advantage over anybody else uh, and what makes us different from the modernization enterprise, which has their own mission, which is modernizing the Army for 10, 20 years out, is that we're trying to use capabilities that we have today to fight tonight. 
Uh, and so how do we make those incremental changes on the margin? And with an eye on the next ridge line, looking at those uh, emerging technologies, and then we put it all together as an operational warfighting headquarters, and we train with it. And that's how we get good. That's where the, you learn those tough lessons, and that's where the growth is, and that's what drives the Army forward that informs and de-risk the Army's modernization efforts, but it also makes us a more lethal uh, warfighting headquarters. So with that, well, I'll leave you something. So, I mean, uh, just to kind of dovetail if you're saying it's people first and winning matters. Our culture is ba starts and ends with our people, and the data brings the right decision at the right time for the commander to have decision dominance so we can fight and win, right? So how, how, does, this all, how does this all begin? We have a founding do uh, foundational document in 18 Airborne Corps called Who We Are. Right? Within that Who We Are document, we talk about innovation, right? How to, how to get to that data centricity. How do we become that data-enabled machine learning, artificial intelligence, leveraging all that technology to give the commander uh, the decision and the information in time and space to accelerate their decision making process to to have overmatch against their enemy to fight and win so we innovate to solve problems right we innovate to take advantage of an opportunity and we innovate to make sure our leaders can be present with their soldiers right Th those three things are, are the purpose we innovate in the 18 airborne corps um, so part of that as well is finding is, is creating that data literacy. How do we have those? Where do, how do we find the talent in our formation to already have that niche uh, curiosity or, or background of training that they've done so either on the weekends, whether it's YouTube learned coding, or they have actually gone to school before they join the army, or even while they're in the army, using their tuition assistance to to, to learn on to do something they, they they love and enjoy doing. They just don't have it as part of their skill set and their job. So we're building that dig, uh, data literacy, and I'm sure Mr. Summers will talk about how we uh, onboard and upscale that across uh, the core, all right? And then what we found is, is, is as we educate our, our leaders and our soldiers on data literacy, uh, we had this, on the other side of the circle, this, this, this is, is the people that are we call data gatekeepers, and we're all data gatekeepers. I'm sure you all have your own computer, you all have your cell phones, you have all your favorites, you have all your files you've ever had for your entire experience from job to job to job. You don't share. You didn't get to be the undergrad at kindergartner because you're, you're not sharing, right? In the 18 Airborne Corps, we have to share that data, right? We had to get people from stop being a data gatekeeper to become a data literate and share that information so we all have a situational understanding. All right, we're pushing beyond that right now. And, and, and beyond the, to add on the talent management aspect, right? So we gotta find those young soldiers out there, right? They're gonna, they joined our data warfare company and I'm sure you've, heard, you've seen the stories about how we grew that. That all grew under Project Ridgeway. Project Ridgeway is that overall program in the 18 Airborne Corps where all our innovation lives and breathes, right? That's where all the success has contributed to that, right? That, that starts with an innovation outpost, a place where we can all come in in collaboration, not just in 18 Airborne Corps, but also our USOC, JSOC partners to come together and they can all innovate together, right? Solve those problems, right? So they can educate themselves and get out there and really get to the edge where we need them most, where commanders can actually, where we can influence things. Um, how do we identify those young soldiers, right? It, it starts with a good idea is trapped in every squad, right? And that's what Dragon's Lair is about. It's a platform for soldiers to go through Ensign, present an idea and a potential solution to that idea and pitch it to the senior leaders, not just across the core, we've also had people uh, as far as industry and other agencies across the joint force as part of that panel. And we upscale that idea and we present that whether we solve it, we use it to solve a problem with the 18 Airborne Corps across the Army or the joint force. Um, we, use, we also have our, our, DIT, our Dragon Innovation Team Training, where we use our educational pro partners. We bring young soldiers and even senior leaders together in a consortium, and we have working groups. We, get, we, we teach them how to solve problems in a new innovative way. We present real problems that are confronting us in the 18 Airborne Corps, and they go through this two-week process of education on how to learn in a, in a new and unique way and deliver an innovative idea, to, a solution to the leadership when it's all said and done with. Um, and then what about those young coders out there? Because coding is a language, right? We, get, we, we find those every day. When we find some, we bring up, we, we, they rise up, and I interview each one personally, right? They take a little test, uh, how good are you at that language that we all speak for the coding environment that's a standard in the, in the Army and the Joint Force. And then once it's done, we send them for a nine month training portion where they do the Tron uh, training program. And as it's done, they go to a little bit of a fellowship program. We're actually in an environment with people who've been doing this for years and they over the shoulder, they are taught how to solve those problems 
at the edge. And then they come back to the 18 Airborne Corps and they work on our data warfare company. They work in Eagle Works in 101st. They work in 82nd. They go back down there and they share that information and they generate that excitement about, I can solve these problems. I may be uh, a soldier in a 7th Transportation Brigade up in JBLE, the Joint Base L uh, Langley Eustis, and I'm a maintainer, but I like to code on the weekend. And I went through this process and now, I have coded a solution for the Army in, in a tool that I'll talk about later, like the first one, soldier design developed that's solving real problems in our Army. So that's how we get after that data literacy in the 18 Airborne Corps as part of that culture of who we are. So, so first, uh, I think I'm a digital native, so uh, <laughs> may, maybe not everyone uh, on the panel. but. Um, you know, both uh, General Cogbill and CSM Holland, you know, have, have walked through, you know, what it means to be a learning organization for us and the discrete things that, that we have put in place to support that. And, and that's critically important because if you don't address the culture, you'll never reap the benefits of everything that we're going to talk about for, you know, the next 30 or 45 minutes. And I'll give it a discrete example here in a moment. But you need to work the people and that's all part of the culture. You need to attack the processes. If you just try to digitize a broken process, guess what? You have a digital broken process, and then everyone is discouraged because they think digital is gonna fix everything, but it won't and it doesn't. Sometimes it makes it worse. Technology, I'll be honest with you. This is not a technology issue. The same conversations that I am having today, I literally had a decade ago in the private sector. The tech is there. It is our ability to understand it, to speak the language of others that can bring the technology to us, have the people to employ it, but most importantly, it's about us willing to learn, to take chances, and to do something different. But guess what? We're gonna fail every once in a while, and something's not gonna work. That's okay. That's part of being a learning organization. You can fail fast, learn from it, and still reap significant benefits. Uh, and the last is data, and we're gonna talk a lot about data, so I won't get after that. So it's people, process, tech, and data. But when you do this right, you reap incredible rewards. So a great example is uh, for, our, for our latest mission, uh, when we were going uh, to Europe, we had a requirement uh, for data collection. We did not have a tool to collect that data. So guess what? We had a, a data warfare company that had trained coders that could sit down and over a couple day period, a couple days, develop an app that we could put in the DoD app store and load onto the TAC devices for our paratroopers that were deploying forward. We were able to go through that entire process in about three weeks. Even in the private sector, building and releasing an app in three weeks is pretty freaking amazing. And we were able to do that with green suitors. And that's because the leadership you hear, you see on this panel, it's because of the leadership we have with both General Carrillo and General Donahue. But more importantly, it's because this is being embraced all the way throughout, through all of the echelons all the way down. And that's when you know change becomes sustainable and repeatable, and that's really when you get the benefits. So we're incredibly excited to be here and uh, talk about data, which is exciting to me. I don't know if everybody, but uh, we're gonna talk more about it. <laughs> well, that's good. That's a good transition. So let's talk about data centrality and, and how um, it uh, enables force generation and the building of combat power. So everything that we've mentioned, we talk about readiness, we talk about mission command, all of those require data. And, it's, and, and to CSM Tolman's point, access to the data. One of the largest challenges that we have in our system is being able to access that data. One, we don't have the pipelines. So how can I physically go get that data? And I don't mean in an email or in a spreadsheet, but how can I go reach into a system and get that data automatically? But then if we do have those pipelines, I'm not allowed to see that data or to have that data. So how do, how do we break down those walls and, and how do we proliferate the, the data sharing? So it's incredibly important for us to continue to, to drive, to break down these walls and to enable this. And we've proven that when you can connect the systems and you can share this data, amazing things happen. So we can talk about 
you know, the, the outload process. So when we pick up the phone to answer the call, it starts our sequence. Traditionally, that involves a dozen plus different systems across a half a dozen organizations. None of them talk directly or interact directly. So what that means is we have soldiers and airmen and others literally going like this and handing physical pieces of paper to each other to try to meet an 18-hour sequence. Physics is almost against you. The only reason it's not is because we just have amazing, talented, dedicated people that will put down their shoulder and drive through it. But there's a better way to do it. And so that's what we have been building based upon uh, our experiences last summer in HKIA, being able to connect all of those databases and to flow that information seamlessly all the way up. One, it makes us faster. Two, it makes us better. As changes occur, we can react to those changes proactively so we're postured correctly. That could include force flow. So the way that we structure our forces to flow in is incredibly important to us, particularly if we're going to be the first ones there. So knowing if there's an issue in route, if the sequence in which we're planning to arrive, we need to make decisions immediately. Hours, minutes, seconds count. And the last is it allows commanders and leaders to be present and focused on preparing for the mission instead of worrying about what bumper number is at what order in the MASA, which is in what order to get on the back of a plane. They're tired and they're frustrated instead of focusing on preparing you know, their, their soldiers for the task. So we have great partners with AMC and, and with the Air Force and with others to make this happen. And, it's, and again, it's all because we're a learning organization that understands the value of data and don't accept no for an answer and understand there's a better way to do it. General? Sure. All right. So, I, like I said earlier, I had the, I've had the privilege to work for two great bosses, and they both make great decisions, a lot of great decisions during the course of the day. But probably the best decision that they they made was to hire uh, Jared as our CTO. Uh, so, bringing in a highly qualified expert is a game changer when you're trying to do something as transformative as become a data centric organization. Uh, not only did we, we we had such good uh, success with Jared that uh, we also brought on a CDO, a, a chief data officer, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Jock Paget, who was started off in the 82nd. So now we've kind of got the, the one-two punch uh, with, with that, that expertise from, from industry uh, and, and kind of to be able to do the up and out and the down and in and to really drive this effort forward. So it's, uh, he's a great accelerant and we're lucky to have him, as, as you can see. So uh, for me as the chief of staff, uh, as I tried to figure out data, the first thing, like you said, was to get it out of your inbox uh, and get it in the cloud. And so that, as, that was an imperative for, for this, the staff so that all of our data had to be accessible. And then the other mandate was all of our data needed to be live. So that means the death of the PowerPoint slide. And you want to talk about trying to, the, the challenges of weaning people off their, you know, their whoobie of the PowerPoint slide and say, nope, I don't, we don't want to see that because as soon as you hit save on that slide, that data is no longer valid, it's dated. Uh, so live data only. And so there's different platforms and we've had to work our way through that as staff officers, uh, you know, using Vantage, using Advana, different things to, and then, and then commanders have to also understand that the, the display may not be as pretty as PowerPoint, but you, the numbers that you're getting, one, don't require uh, hours upon hours of wasted staff energy collating and swivel chairing this data, but also um, it, it you know, it's, it's accurate and it's real um, and it's, it's much more useful to commanders. So from a staff perspective, and you know, that's, that's your personnel stats, your maintenance stats, your readiness, your training, uh, all the things that go into a USR. Uh, when we brief our commander, it's, in, it's using live data and that's his imperative as well. And so with that, now we talked about that's kind of the staff function, but we need it across all war fighting functions. So earlier I talked about the importance of the, of the OODA loop uh, and making decisions faster than, than your adversaries. And, it, and really about, you know, it, it's also about shortening the kill chain, but there's also, in order to do that, you've got to have that uh, complete situational awareness as a commander. So one of the things uh, that General Donahue has really been driving hard is a single pane of glass. So instead of, you know, uh, a commander being trapped in a jock, uh, the commander can have all of, all of this data coming into one source on a tablet uh, that's gonna bring in not only the enemy situation, the friendly situation, our readiness, 
the weather, the terrain, ammunition status, uh, you name it, uh, it's all getting pumped into this, multiple layers upon layers into a single uh, display to give that commander situational awareness. And it's, it's, draw, it's pulling information from the cloud so that it allows the commander to, to connect and disconnect and then uh, have that uh, mission command on the move. And then we're also using, uh, you know, looking at uh, innovative ways to, to transport that data using the Kymeta uh, uh, antenna on our vehicle so we can have mobile command and control as well as uh, redundancy and low Earth orbit satellites using Starlink. So pulling in some of the tech, but at the end of the day, we're just trying to enable the data to get onto a single pane of glass to allow the commander to be present and to make decisions faster than the adversary. So that's one effort. The other effort, we talked about the OODA loop and, and closing kill chains and shortening kill chains. If we look at our broad area surveillance targeting effort uh, in our, Siri, our Scarlet Dragon exercises, so our FISC Corps, uh, Colonel Joe O'Callaghan, uh, has been leading this effort for the Corps. But we're, you know, this is using commercial satellite imagery and national technical means to pull all this in, to be able to do wide area surveillance, to cover huge amounts of battle space as the core battle space continues to increase in size. Uh, and then we're using uh, you know, the Maven smart system and algorithms in order to, to, to detect those things that are on our high payoff target list. So that allows the commander to see where the enemy's key uh, uh, capabilities are and then to target them. So having an understanding of where our shooters are and then uh, passing that target data uh, digitally from uh, the sensor to the shooter via you know, AFATADs tags or whatever we're using to pass that down to the gun line to actually put rounds on target. And it, what, you know, what we've done in, in the series of five different Scarlet Dragons is, is pretty uh, groundbreaking in terms of uh, just shortening that kill chain from, uh, from hours uh, to, to minutes, really. So, and, and I'm talking about like, you know, lots of hours, 24 hours, 10, 10 to 20 hours and, and getting it down into to minutes. And we're executing this in real time. We're doing it with joint partners. And like I said, as, a, as an operational headquarters, this is just training for us. So, you know, we, we create the event. Uh, and we leverage the Marine Corps, the Air Force, the Navy, who are, have similar interests in this joint all-domain command and control uh, in order to be able to, to, they're also interested in shortening kill chains and having better situational awareness. So we continue to push on that. Uh, the next evolution of this will be with, uh, with one of our combatant commands. And then in addition to that, we're, uh, we're, for the last two years, have been participants in the Army's Project Convergence, which I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with. So Project Convergence 21, and then we're also scheduled to, to participate in Project Convergence uh, 22. So although the core is deployed, uh, we've been balancing that effort. Uh, some folks uh, that can walk and chew bubblegum at the same time have been managed to, to participate in the planning and all the comexes and everything that goes into that because that's a high payoff training event for the core and really like a, uh, for, the entire, for the entire Army. Very good. Fantastic. Sir, sir you brought up a, a lot of little fantastic points in there. And, you know, part of the innovation effort, like I mentioned, is, you know, we want to solve a problem. In a lot of these cases, in order to solve the problem, all I really want is I want the authority, I want the resources, and I want, a, I want, I want the accountability, whether it's myself or I want to hold something accountable. And a couple, a couple of the other efforts we had as far as, uh, you know, a lot of problems solved by the young enlisted soldiers and non-commissioned officers in the 18 Airborne Corps, uh, a couple efforts, right? Uh, something as simple as like the leader engagement tool, um, which, which you might have seen something discussed at the Nominal Sergeant Major Solution Summit that we had recently with the Sergeant Major of the Army. That was just an idea uh, thought of, of Command Sergeant Major Pitt from the 82nd Airborne Division. We had a warrant officer on his own computer on the weekend, developed a great tool about how to hold leaders accountable by doing things in the barracks, maintaining presence, again, leaders present, getting leaders present in the barracks, solving problems before they even happen. And then we had this great non-commissioned officer named Staff Sergeant Hart we identified through that trauma fellowship program. He came in and he took it to the next level, right? We've iterated it. It's on the second level now. Now it, it's actually on a platform uh, that's behind a DOD ID CAC enabled system firewall. We're working on the authority to operate so we can upscale this across the Army because we've proven on Fort Bragg alone, we've had a 25% reduction in crime, whether that's soldier on soldier harassment, uh, assault, larceny, theft, all those things just by having leaders present. We solved the problem, we took advantage of an opportunity. Another great uh, thing we've been working on, and this is that we're working across the Corps is something as simple like uh, using our resources, but getting them to all our soldiers in time and space. Holistic health and fitness. We're looking in all domains, whether it's lethality, whether it's spirituality, whether it's cognition, right? Whether it's nutrition, right? And we've, we use this tool to really 
deliver the expert to the soldier at the right time and place to make that soldier a better version of himself through micro assessments, just by enabling uh, the cloud and an algorithm to generate a score to help that soldier become a best version of himself. And then another tool we're working on, a small unit readiness tool, I'm working with the Program Executive Office for Enterprise Information Systems uh, for uh, an effort for, with, with Vantage uh, as part of the Executive Steering Committee, is we've, we've basically got access, applic uh, Army uh, application programming interfaces with over 130 programs of record. It's kind of scary that we had to access 130 programs of record to really deliver information on the backbone of an algorithm to do prediction for readiness tasks. So instead of the first sergeant and company commander downloading things from systems of record and creating Excel workbooks to tell people when they gotta go do their hearing or when they gotta go to CI for an appointment, this algorithm touches all that data through those data links on a, on a, a completely configurable workspace and it enables that, that those decisions to be pushed down below that company level to platoon sergeant, platoon leader, to squad leader level. So those readiness tasks are taken care of with appropriate leadership, right? I've pushed down the, the readiness requirements, those tasks to the appropriate level who has the authority to own that, the accountability to execute those tasks. And we've seen is a 50% reduction in first sergeant times in their office spent doing readiness tasks because all those things are reduced to be on them because we downloaded it on a, off a system of record, placed it on an, on a, mic, uh, in a Microsoft platform, in this case, you know, a PowerPoint, and we put it up on the screen in a training meeting or in a command and staff meeting. And how are we gonna shorten that time, uh, that, that, that chain for decision making? That same configurable workspace, we'll work on making that the same, uh, an opportunity, to, that same information, that near live data, available to commanders at Echelon. So now we're not duplicating efforts <coughs> where it's one configurable workspace at Echelon so we can see that data at time and space and understand that we're doing this before the event. So when we talk to immediate response force, continuous response force, mm. I don't have to do a big planned event to make sure that everybody is healthy and administratively ready to deploy and fight and win tonight. We've already done those things left of that event, 90 days left, before we even assume that readiness requirement for the Army is the Earth One, because we, we have an algorithm in place that has access to all that data in the cloud to enable the leader at the lowest level to execute that task and function. All the way. Airborne. You know, as I sit here listening to the importance of being a learning organization and the importance of data, I can't help but think and and remember that we are in the fourth industrial revolution and the 18th Airborne Corps is absolutely leading that revolution with, with the learning and with the tools and techniques and just the approach to uh, how to use data to accomplish the mission. Let's shift now to talk a little bit about deliberate versus expedited deployment. General Fogg, you wanna yep, talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, thank you, sir. So I think, uh, you know, we've, we've definitely uh, been talking about uh, contingency and expedited uh, deployments, and that's what the 18th Airborne Corps and uh, your divisional organizations do. Um, deliberate uh, deployment, uh, simply put, is you know when it's going to happen. You can plan for it. It's, you know, it's uh, um, been organized and planned. It might be one of our rotational forces that are... Uh, going to support operations in Europe or in in the Pacific um, and that's it's planned and we can really do that very very well we can also do you know contingency deployments in our sequence very very well but I think uh, what has been emphasized multiple times here is the criticality of time and the innovation that I'm hearing which some of this is absolutely new to me and it's incredibly powerful um, uh, you're saving time for your leaders. You're saving time for your first sergeants to do things that they have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. When you can save the time from those kind of routine things that are required, then you have more time to train. You have more time to invest in your soldiers and be able to make sure they're ready to fight and win on the battlefield. And that's what we want to be able to do because that's what energizes our leaders. That's what energizes our soldiers. That's how we keep uh, soldiers and families in the Army because they're doing the things that they signed up to do. And so um, uh, 18th Airborne Corps has absolutely indicated that they're a learning organization and AMC is a learning organization as well. 
and we've been collaborating with the 18th Airborne Corps to look at the things that we can do to what we kind of uh, use the moniker of predictive logistics. How can we anticipate requirements? How can we be ready and save that critical time for you to be able to do the things you need to do and enable you with ammunition, with parts, with readiness, with maintenance, you know, ensuring that we have the power projection platform ready. Do all those things so that you can get there and fight and do the things uh, that our nation is asking you to do. Uh, so this uh, collaboration, and you've often, you know, heard the, the term already, uh, sensor to shooter, we add something to that. And so we say sensor to shooter to sustainer. And so how do we make sure that we can continue to be able to enable the things that you do uh, as you initially get on the battlefield and then able to have the right endurance to maintain the fight, to have, as the Chief of Staff of the Army said, uh, the speed and the range to execute uh, very, very quickly. The, the targeting that used to take hours and days, now as we talk about, potentially takes minutes, which means that you're going to need ammunition much quicker, right? And it needs to be there. And we need to be able to see ourselves and anticipate when a piece of equipment is going to fail and get the part there before it fails. Anticipate because we have uh, you know, sensor to shooter to sustainer, when that fuel cell, because there's sensors on fuel cells, to know collectively when you need fuel. And that log pack to the location is already moving in that direction to refuel those combat platforms before it's required or before you ask for it on your log stack. Um, how can we understand uh, and innovate in a space where we have the predictive analytics, the algorithms that you talk about, that, that suite of things to know that uh, when, you know, what kind of class nine do we need to stock? What type of forward positioning do we need to execute and cache ammunition forward at the right strategic locations? Uh, again, so that we're ready before you get there. Um, so we're, we're absolutely learning uh, from Jared and from others. We've been talking uh, a lot um, in your you know, current op. Uh, we want to make sure that we can do this for U.S. forces first, of course, but we also want to be able to do this for our allies and partners and build their capacity. And we'll be able to track what they're doing and when they need something. There's a huge demand right now for foreign military sales of U.S. equipment, uh, you know, all for, you know, the things that are, you know, they see evidence of right now. So, so we want to be able to understand that demand and be able to provide platforms when it's needed. Uh, we're doing that in support of, you know, the conflict that's going on in Europe right now with uh, supporting the Ukrainians. Um, and we want to be able to not just provide the platform, but to be able to understand its readiness and provide sustainment as required. And we want to do that for all our partners and allies. Uh, so we're in that space with, in coordination with 18 Airborne Corps and others uh, to be able to innovate and to be able to do that better. If we look at any theater, if we look at the Pacific Theater uh, uh, and we look at the islands out there, you've got to be able to do, thing, uh, do things and provide the enabling capabilities, you know, at the forward edge. You want to be able to have advanced manufacturing to be able to digitally look at a part that you need and print it right there. You want to be able to produce water, uh, you, know, uh, you know, right there. Uh, in that space, and there's there's things that we're looking in innovation to be able to produce water, you know, um, you know, from <coughs> forward locations instead of having to distribute it. We want to be able to look at tele maintenance and be able to communicate and be able to fix something and provide the diagnosis and the expertise, you know, from one island to another without without having to travel there. So that is kind of the space that we're looking at to be able to innovate and get better because contingency deployments in the future, everything that we're talking about is reducing the time to ex for execution. And so that's kind of where we're leaning in uh, and working, and we really appreciate 18th Airborne Corps, the things that they're doing, and the collaboration that we have uh, going on. Very well, Mr. Summers? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Major General Fogg just talked about some, some really exciting things. Um, and, and it goes, goes back to a, to a previous comment that you know, a lot of telemaintenance and others, these are not new concepts. These are just new concepts for us uh, in the Army or in the DOD. Um, you know, I think COVID taught 
uh, a lot of you or maybe members of your family that you don't even have to go into the doctor's office anymore for a lot of things. You can do a tele-appointment in many cases as effectively and you don't have to sit and wait around in a, in a waiting room for you know, an hour or two. So it's even a more efficient use of your time. So how can we leverage technology? How can we be a learning organization to adapt technology that has been proven time and time again in the private sector or in others and apply it to make us more effective uh, and more lethal uh, to deliver the, the capability that the, the nation calls upon us? You know, a, a very exciting collaboration that we're doing with AMC is in the predictive uh, maintenance space. Uh, again, I'm sorry, I sound like a broken record, but this is something that is widely available. Uh, available. Many of you probably have a vehicle that is, you know, five or a years or uh, less old, and you probably have an app on your phone that you can open and understand the health of your car or your truck. It's gonna tell you if your air pressure is low, if you need an oil change, or if something else is wrong. Why can't we do that for our vehicles, our aircraft, uh, and our machines? The answer is we can, and we need to, and we should. And then we need that data to feed directly into our mission command systems. So General Cogbill talked about our single pane of glass effort. Our goal is to seamlessly integrate all of these lines of data to drastically shorten that decision cycle. You, 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 you mentioned uh, needing a lot more munitions when you can fire a lot faster. We also need that direct integration from operations and intelligence to make sure that we're being incredibly selective of what type of munition we use for what target. Because not only are we gonna be able to see many more targets, but we need to make sure that we have enough of the right type of munitions in reserve for when dynamic targeting does occur and wish we had something in reserve. So that's, again, close partnership with joint partners. So how do we seamlessly, that we're, and we're working on this closely with the Air Force and the Marines and others, but to align other services, the, the Air Force and the Marines and others, their data for their ATO cycles, for the aircraft on station, and how do we most effectively leverage their munitions? Because they're gonna RTB, return to base, and they're gonna load more uh, you know, smart bombs or, or others on the pylons, and then they're gonna go back up. Well, it's a lot harder for us you know, to, to reload HIMARS out on an on island chain. Um, and so how do we make smart decisions, you know, as a JTF uh, three-star headquarters to really enable the force? So that's what we're working on. That's what we're focused on. And that's what gets me so excited uh, to get up every morning and to come into work to, to work with just exceptional individuals like these. Sergeant Major, could you comment on deliberate and expedited uh, deployments a little bit? Y yes, absolutely, sir. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's who we are. Fat, flash, lethal, accurate, and effective. You know, when I think about uh, outloading for the HKI operation, I, th you know, one memory comes uh, the forefront of my mind. That's General Daly, uh, on the ground, breaking down walls and making things happen to get the force, the required force structure, on the right aircraft, to be delivered to the combatant commander at the time he needed. General Cogbill talked about 96 hours. With the opportunity to go as, uh, as early as 18, everybody wants us in 18, right? And but they want the right. Uh, force structure and the right measure of lethality there, whether it's a non-combatant evacuation operation or it's a combat credible force, right? And we think about the in terms of HKIA, you know, and J Mr. Summers brought up like, hey, 12 different systems and six different agencies. We want all that in a single pane of glass. We want it resilient. We want it in the cloud, right? We want to have access to it. The commander needs to see it. He, needs, he or she needs to be making decisions in time and space at the, to, to fulfill those requirements. So when you think about that, we gotta go now, and we're gonna do this mission based off this contingency operation, and we can figure that force to it and that force flow to it, and then we're airborne, we're transatlantic, we're transpacific, we're transpolar region. And in the air, we decide, the, because of the situation on the ground has changed, that force package needs to change. So maybe we have to land at different nodes within the CENTCOM AR, for example, reconfigure loads. Is that system, is that single pan of glass resilient enough to change manifests, to maintain a count of people, change the equipment posture because maybe now uh, we need a combat credible force and now we need 
different types of munitions or different types of uh, th things like howitzers, or maybe we don't need those because now it's a non, it's a non combat combatant evacuation operation, so we gotta download those things. I no longer need those systems. They're gonna stay at this airfield. Now I need these soldiers on this aircraft to go this way. And I need them in this sequence now because the mission has changed because of what's going on on the ground, right? The system has to be resilient enough to do that in flight because the combatant commander wants us in 18 hours on the ground less than 96, right? And that's what a single pane of glass is, right? When we're talking expedited operations in time and space. And many times we're putting our shoulder down and we're breaking through barriers, just like General Daly did for us in that operation. And other times it's more deliberate. We know what the mission is. We've discussed it. We've designed the force flow. We've got exactly what we need as far as in the in, in jokes and everything else. And we put things in times and space. We put the configure the loads and we get exactly what the combatant commander has at the right location at the right time in the case of what we need to do in, in UCOM AOR. So, that, that's when I see that in how data enables us and how placing things on a single pane of glass and it's resilient enough to execute those things we have to do in support of the joint mission, sir. Excellent. Thanks for tying that together. All the way. Airborne. You know, uh, one of the things I remember from my early years uh, in the 82nd Airborne Division is uh, a non-commissioned officer told me that, uh, that the Air Force puts the air in airborne. And so now we're gonna shift to uh, joint partnerships. Let's, uh, let's discuss the, the role and impact of joint partnerships on the 18th Airborne Corps and the mission and, 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 and how that influences. So sir, would you take us away? Absolutely, sir. And I'm, I'm glad you started off with your experience to begin your career because I'm gonna talk about mine for a second to set the stage for this. So much like yourself, probably my first joint experience in the DOD was being a new C-17 co-pilot flying airdrop missions with paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne Division here at Fort Bragg. Ooh. And that <laughs> set the stage for when we talk about innovation, when we talk about data-driven uh, decisions, when we talk about the importance of a learning organization, when we talk about innovation at the edge, which is the subject of, of, of our panel here today, that edge being projecting the force starting off right here, we can't do that, and that innovation is often incomplete if we're siloing it in an Army silo and splitting it off to an Air Force silo and all of our other joint partners as well. We have to not only bring those together and collaborate, but we have to populate it down to that lowest soldier, that lowest airman and civilian and joint partner here at Fort Bragg and across the DOD, or else that process is incomplete. Now, I'm gonna start off with a little bit of a story of the evolution of how I've seen innovation, team building processes and relationships built here at Fort Bragg and how they related to the outloads that we've seen while I've been here in the last three years. So in January of 2020, there was an outload of the immediate response force elements to counter Iranian aggression in the Middle East. The way that that process went at the time was that the relationships that we had built within the 43rd AMOG and across through the 18th Airborne Corps and the 82nd Airborne Division Everyone was calling each other and it was just a pickup game. So when we got notified of the N hour sequence, the Air Force elements on the base got a notification from our command post. And then it was just calling those battalion commanders that I knew, that my team knew, tying in with 82nd or more G3 Air, G3 of the core, to find out what was going on and how we were going to best support that outload. Now the complexity with which one of these outloads go was something that I wasn't familiar with before we got here um, at, at this location, but it was quickly overwhelming and it was hard for the team on the Air Force and the Army side to keep up and make sure those requirements were put into the system for jokes and validated through A2Y, allocated by Air Mobility Command and tasked by US Transcom to get it off the ground and project it out the door. Now since then, we had an event come up where we determined that the runway here at Pope about two and a half years ago was, as I could put it lightly, on its last legs within a couple of years of being unusable for large mobility aircraft. Now, with the partnerships we were able to build throughout the process of planning a runway closure here at Pope to redo it, full depth concrete, redo the lighting system, and set this up for a power projection platform capability for the next 40 plus years, we were able to cement those relationships to make sure that all of our tenant units at Pope Army Airfield, the 82nd Airborne Division, and 18th Airborne Corps elements were able to offsite to different locations to continue the mission. It's probably the biggest continuity of operations, the biggest coup plan 
that I've ever seen and that a lot of us have ever seen. However, we did very, um, very deliberate planning for this between the team at the 43rd AMOG, Air Mobility Command, Transcom, 18th Air Morgue Corps, G35 was integral in that. But we came up with the plan to offsite everyone to their different locations, validated it through serious uh, validation exercises, several series of them, and then executed the runway closure in June of 2015, 2021. When we did that, um, we weren't expecting that we were going to launch the force to execute a non-combatant evacuation operation. When we got notification that that was gonna happen, everyone scrambled into action. However, unlike the January of 2020 launch, since we had done that deliberate planning, since we had built processes and relationships, we were able to execute that a lot more efficiently and effectively. Now when we talk about the ComRel, and we talk about how the Air Force and Army relationships went leading up to that decision to launch the force, we saw that we needed to have an organization that mirrored the C2 element of Task Force Dragon here at Fort Bragg. And the way we did that on the Air Force side was we reorganized ourselves from the 43rd AMOG in execution to an organization that we got authorization from Air Mobility Command to call ourselves Task Force Griffin. So transitioning from an Air Mobility Operations Group staff to an A staff with functions therein to align and give the Army and the Air Force elements one single focal point by which we could validate requirements through Air Mobility Command, U.S. Transcom, make sure that the crews and tails were assigned to the right cargo loads and get them out the door, all in one location down at Joint Base Charleston. And it was especially important because we were working with our partners down there at the 628th Air Base Wing and the 437th Airlift Wing. We couldn't have done that without their help, and we couldn't have done that without the task organization that we brought to the table with Task Force Griffin. Now that continued to evolve as we moved into the deliberate planning for the, uh, the Ukraine assistance mission. That was codified in an operations order at Air Mobility Command and then put out to the force so that we could request support because doing this at a home field is different than doing it from Joint Base Charleston. We had built-in help at Joint Base Charleston in the two wings that exist there. We didn't have that help here at Fort Bragg. We rolled pretty thin here as a 650-person Air Mobility Operations Group in a big sea of Army, right? So when we request that support and get that augmentation, that being codified, we're able to very deliberately plan out our roles and responsibilities between the Air Force, between the Army, and project the force out the door to assist NATO and assist Ukraine in bolstering our efforts there. So from the time when I arrived here in 2019 to now in 2022, almost 2023, we've seen two large outloads of the immediate response force elements. Now, the way that that has evolved the processes, the people, and the relationships is all centered around the innovation. And again, not just siloed in the Army context, not just siloed in the Air Force context, but siloed all together between our two organizations to make things happen. So when we talk about innovation at the edge, the partnership between the Air Force, the Army, and our joint warfighting partners here at Fort Bragg and across the enterprise has evolved during the last three years to an extent that I would have never have imagined, and I don't think most of us would have imagined here at Fort Bragg. I think that's something to hang our hats on and be pretty proud of. Very good, very good. Chief, you want to comment on that from your perspective? Yes, sir. So uh, CJ nailed it. I mean, when you talk about the way they organize for combat based off lessons learned, that's innovation. So it's not always about the tech, like Jared said. It's, it's about understanding the, the problem, the complexity, and then bringing calm to that chaos by either a technical solution or reorganizing our policy or whatever, but just it's good heads up ball. And, uh, and clearly we've learned at, at every iteration. So as we do reps and sets, uh, it's, it's important that we continue to get better. And, and Task Force Griffin is a great example. But we talk about the importance of joint, you know, joint partners. Nobody knows that more than a paratrooper. So paratroopers were joint before joint war fighting was a thing. Uh, if you go all the way back to World War II with the 101st and the 82nd, jumping out of airplanes. Now, those were Army airplanes, okay? That was the Army Air Corps, uh, which gave birth to the Air Force. But they were, <laughs> they were still dependent on naval gunfire, right? Because when you go in, you go pretty light. And if you saw what those paratroopers jumped in, you know, in Normandy, uh, what they were, had with them uh, and their fire support capability, they were dependent on naval gunfire. And that hasn't changed. Paratroopers are still inherently joint as we jump out of Air Force aircraft. And, we, and that's a forcing function for us to come together and work together. Uh, but then also because we don't, you know, we, we, we can push howitzers and whatever we can push out the back of a C-17 will be on the ground with us. But then we're dependent on that joint force for the joint fires uh, and joint logistics and everything else that keeps us in the fight. 
Um, and, and the best way, you know, you have to train as you fight. And so the, getting those reps and sets, uh, whether that's, you know, the you know, joint forceful entry operations, uh, whether that's the Scarlet Dragon exercise, uh, whether it's, you know, fill in the blank, or a real world deployment, we're constantly learning. And the one thing you learn anytime you operate with joint partners is that talking to your joint partner is not always intuitive and it's not always easy because our programs of record did not evolve in a joint construct in a way that they would all be interoperable and have seamless communications. And, it, and that gets even more complicated as we're talking about data, right? And so it's not just the push to talk, but it's like, how are we passing target data? How are we passing maintenance data, personnel data, et cetera, et cetera, to a joint task force headquarters? Uh, you find yourself doing a lot of swivel chair operations, typing on one system and then another. And any time you find yourself doing that swivel chair, or you find yourself having to constantly call or answer the phone because somebody wants an update on your status on fill in the blank, there's usually a data solution, a data-driven solution to that problem that you're having because it all results in wasted energy. And that energy could be, should be put on the commander working his way through that OODA loop and shortening kill chains and finding opportunities to kill the enemy. And so that's the importance of what we're doing. And you know, at the end of the day, data is just ones and zeros. You know, for, for the layman, it goes into the cloud, it's all ones and zeros, there's a way to make it talk, okay? Uh, we have smart guys like Jared and, 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 and Sergeant Harp and guys that are gonna get on a machine and, and code some stuff, write an algorithm that'll come up with a cross-domain solution, come up with some sort of Rosetta Stone that'll allow the Marines to talk to the Army, to talk to the Air Force, to talk to the Navy, talk to interagency folks, and then most importantly, what we haven't talked about is our, our partners and allies, because we will not fight alone ever again. Right? We'll always fight with partners and allies. So if you think it's hard to talk to ourselves inside of the joint force, you know, now let's talk to other nations, you know, you know, not just NATO partners, but who, you know, wherever we find ourselves in the world as, as, as a global contingency core, we have to figure out how to do that. And those problems, we, you know, at, when you're moving at the speed of war, you don't have time to go back through the acquisition process and palm for something that's gonna be delivered five to 10 years out. You've gotta solve those problems on the edge. And you can only do that if you're using live data, if people understand data, if it's in the cloud, and you've got the compute and the know-how on the edge to solve the problems on the, on the battlefield. Well, all the way. Airborne. Well, I must say I've got a whole list of questions here, and so I must invoke the one-minute rule. So I'll ask the question, and you try to answer the question in one minute so we can get through most of these, okay? <laughs> Um, Chief, I'm going to give you the most difficult question Thank first. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And I know you would appreciate <laughs> that. Okay, so when the commander has an active dashboard, how does the staff stay ahead of the commander in preparing him for subsequent missions? I, it's about prioritization, really, and understanding the commander's intent for that mission and what your role in that mission is. And so, uh, you know, the all warfighting functions come together uh, in order to help the commander accomplish that mission, but you have to understand his intent, his priorities, so that you can have that data ready and it's accessible and you can explain it. Uh, and then, and then, it, and you can't wait to be asked uh, because you have to, you know, General Donahue's very big on seizing, you know, taking the initiative and seizing opportunity, creating opportunities. And if you see something, and this is why we talk about this culture of innovation and problem solvers versus problem identifiers, we can't be stovepiped in our own little warfighting function. We have to understand that as, as a warfighting headquarters, your, that staff has to be integrated, the data has to be passed, it has to be live, and it has to be accessible. And then when you see that opportunity to, to present something to the commander, where, uh, to, to enable a decision or to inform a decision, you can't be shy about how you do it. Very good. So, Major, this one's for you. Uh, what does your soldier dashboard contain? And it's not necessarily tactical. It could be uh, physical. It could be mental preparedness. It could be soldier skills. What overall do you consider in your soldier dashboard? Thanks for that question, sir, because uh, it's a completely configurable dashboard, and it's relative to what type of unit that is and, and where the, what organization they're in. So if, if I take into context, let's say our 44th Medical Brigade, which is one of our core separates, it's super important for, those, for them to understand uh, in, the, in the system of record mods that accounts for soldier training hours for medics to maintain their certification every two years, to understand, to tie in the training that's in the digital training management system with that to account for their training certifications. To, so that way they don't eventually uh, 
be told to transition from the military service because they failed to meet those training hours requirements and recertification. So if I was a uh, first sergeant in the 44th Medical Brigade, one of the configurable workspaces on my, on my work page would be I could look at each soldier individually and, and I could see how many training hours they have, available uh, training opportunities through Rhythmus, another training, uh, another system of record that ties in there so I could see when's the medical simulation training center going to be open for those soldiers to do their certification for their training space. That would be one example if I was, for example, to, to give you as far as what would be on my personal workspace. As the Corps Star Major, I look specifically at brigade uh, combat, all brigades, both brigade combat teams, are functional, multifunctional brigades. All levels of readiness that require so the, to reporting on the commander's unit status reports to make sure they're ready to fight and win tonight. Yeah, this next question is a bit of a technical geek kind of question, but Chief, uh, so I'll let you go first, Mr. Summers, and then you, Chief, you can uh, follow up. All these data centers add uh, sound great, but they reside in a network. What, how concerned are you that a near peer competitor might be able to mine all this data for their own benefit? So, so that, that's an excellent question. So a, a few things, two, two parts to this answer. So, so the first is there will always be a component of edge compute required for us. So that means we need to bring the, the capability and the capacity to store and to process data no matter where we are. There will be times where we could be potentially uh, disrupted in our communications, or we might be very deliberate to just go dark for a reason or another. So, so that's a first. So, so please don't take away that everything's going to be in the cloud and, and that's going to make everything perfect. It makes it a heck of a lot better and persistent, but you still need that edge compute. Now, when it comes to uh, potential adversaries disrupting or um, you know gaining access to our data. There is a a lot of technology and practices and procedures that goes into place into one ensuring that they can't get access to it in the first place uh, via transport, uh, firewalls, VPN wrappers. I can I can start you know rallying off a, a whole lot, but your eyes will probably roll in the back of your head. But the most important thing is encryption. You encrypt at rest, you encrypt at transport using NSA approved encryption uh, methodology and procedures, and that will provide the level of tech protection necessary. It's the same with financial institutions. You, do, you can do all of your banking on your phone, on your computer, but you only have access to your data. You can't see the person's next to you or the person that is co-located in the same data center as yours. It's the exact same type of zero trust, encryption, uh, practices and procedures that we're putting in place. So, so quite honestly, I feel very comfortable with the strategy uh, that, that we are employing. Um, but it is something that you need to be very cognizant about because if you don't do it well, then it does pose risk to, to operations and organizations. Security of data? Sir, I generally try not to answer technical questions in public, especially <laughs> when I'm seated next to Jared Summers. Uh, but I will tell you, we have the, the best in the business out there defending our networks. Uh, so we've got our Army Cyber Center of Excellence. Uh, we've got you know, the uh, Army Cyber Command. We, we can do offensive and defensive cyber. But the best thing is that we're learning from industry. All right. So the people who are incentivized by profit, uh, you know, on Wall Street with billions upon billions of dollars at stake by uh, in order to protect their networks and protect their data from their competitors, we're using that same encryption technology on our on our servers and our cloud tech uh, in our data to protect it from our adversaries. But the one thing I, I will tell you about the cloud, which you know some of us are still getting our head around the cloud uh, and what that means, but it, it makes our data more uh, resilient and more redundant because we can't you can't take out all of that data and all of you know all of that analytic horsepower with one uh, theater ballistic missile we can put it in sanctuary we can disperse it uh, out of range of our adversaries weapon systems and so that that information is always in the cloud and if you have the ability to touch it and to get uh, if you have the ability you know the satellite you know, through something like Starlink or you've got the antenna you know your Kymeta antenna 
then you can access that data anywhere and then you can kind of go off the grid in a contested environment and then, and, and then continue to move and then come back up, pull that data back down. But if, you know, if the enemy were to take out a single structure, if it's in the cloud, it's protected and it's gonna be accessible wherever you are on the battlefield. Um, the industry question, how can industry uh, really um, uh, coordinate with and be a part of uh, Project Ridgeway? So, so I'll start. So I, I think, you know, uh, there's a lot of innovation and ingenuity uh, in the private sector that we fully want to leverage and, and take care of um, and, and take advantage of. I, I think there, there's some principles, you know, that, that really helps. So the, the first is, you know, if, if you're going to do, uh, you know, business with or interact with the 18th Airborne Corps, first it's, uh, as our boss says, you know, know the professor. So when you come and talk to us, it's a, it's a, you know, a moderately qualified or educated uh, force that understands and can see past buzzwords. So, you know, you know, make sure that the conversations that we have are real. It's not just on a PowerPoint slide, but it's actually real and it works. And, and don't, you know, oversell it because we'll see straight through it. Um, and the other is, you know, you've heard about uh, continuously about our vision uh, that we are currently developing and employing and using to integrate everything. Ensure that your technologies and your platforms or your systems provide the data that we're looking for and it's easy to obtain and to fit inside a broader ecosystem. We don't want silo and we don't want standalone. We want it to be able to be interoperable and scalable across the size and, and scope uh, of what the 18th Airborne Corps you know, brings uh, for the nation. All the way. Airborne. Airborne. Well, we're almost out of time, but I want to have enough time for, uh, for closing comments. So, sir and Saul Major, would you give, uh, give us some closing comments from your perspective? Sure. First, I'd like to say none of this would be possible right, if we weren't challenged. Right. The Chief Staff of the Army challenged General Krilla and he challenged General Donahue to be a data-enabled corps. Right. He, he, he's consistently challenged us. And the Secretary, her objectives further affirmed exact, that we were going the right direction. She's empowered us through her objectives. And we've been fast followers. Right. Army Futures Command has assisted us every step of the way. Our partnership with AMC, the majority of what we could do to get our IRF and SURF units to where they need to be in support of the Joint Force, we couldn't do that without them helping and supporting and, and, and leading some of the efforts. We've been fast followers in those cases. Enterprise Cloud Management Agency, right? We've learned a ton, right? And we're all about sharing and it's essentially who we are. So I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't thank all those partners to, to kind of pave the way for, for us to all have success in the near future. And, in, and then finally, sir, I w again, I'd like to go back that none of this truly, you know, the 18 Airborne Corps, Fort Bragg, the premier power projection platform, I can't thank our community enough uh, because in the end, none of this would be possible if we didn't have a world-class community uh, where our soldiers and family members lived and were a part of every day. So thank you for what you do. Very good. Sir? Yeah, thank you, sir. And sorry, Major, you hit it there with the community. I mean, this is our community of interest right here. So it's, it's a combination of our military, it's, the, it's our industry reps, uh, and it's also academic partners who I don't know if we're represented here, but um, in order to innovate, uh, you know, innovation is something we weren't really talking about a whole lot five, year, five ten years ago, but everybody talks about it now, whether it's in business or whether it's in the military. Um, it, but it, the question used to be, as we started to talk about innovation, well, are you going to do innovation or are you going to do war fighting? We're well, going to do both. You're going to innovate to make you a more lethal warfighting headquarters. You're going to innovate so that you have more time to train. You're going to innovate so that you can be more efficient in how you uh, do your supply and sustainment and your manning, et cetera. So it, it's, it's doing both. But the, the, the irony is uh, the way we're structured right now, uh, you, know, you need three things to, to innovate. You need people, you need resources, and you need authorities. Well, technically, we don't have, I mean, we have people. We don't have people for innovation. Okay, so it, it takes a community of interest to be able to pull all this together. Uh, and that community, uh, I mentioned the, the military and industry, but the other part of that triangle, uh, so, it, you know, is the modernization enterprise, and then you've got academia. And so one thing we haven't talked about is, is how we have leveraged our university partners 
uh, to really help fill in some of those gaps in terms of people, resources, and authorities, uh, starting with Vanderbilt University with the 101st Airborne Division as the, the first partnership, and then growing and scaling to the, the 82nd and Corps having this partnership with the North Carolina State University System, 10th Mountain being partnered with Syracuse, and 3rd Infantry Division being partnered with Georgia Tech, specifically the Georgia Tech Research Institute. So we're able to leverage their expertise, their research dollars, their authorities to do R&D, which we as a operational headquarters do not have, to really drive this thing forward and, and, and create that irreversible momentum that we're trying to create when you build a culture and you demonstrate uh, success. But it really does take that entire community to come together. And, and Jared said it nicely, he said, people, processes, tech, and data, and then it's about getting those reps and sets. So I like what you said about the sensor, shooter, sustainer piece. I had not heard that before. General Donahue adds social media to the end of that. So, because that's the environment that we're in right now. We have to be, we have to play heads up ball. If you read Peter Singer's Like War, you understand the importance of information operations and how that can be a game changer if you look at recent operations in the Ukraine, uh, those who do it well and those who don't do it well. And so, how do you integrate all of that? How do you make that another layer of your data to inform commanders on that single pane of glass to uh, enable decision dominance and to uh, and allow that commander to be present on the battlefield where he or she needs to be? And that's what it's about in the 18th Airborne Corps. Uh, it's an exciting place to be. Um, you know, we're, we're getting ready for this next day. While the, the Corps headquarters is deployed, we're prepping for PC-22, Project Convergence 22. We're already prepping for the next Scarlet Dragon exercise. We're using the single pane of glass downrange in real time, and it's getting better every single day, every iteration. Uh, we're, we're reaching out to industry where people, if you have tech that can solve a problem, uh, then the commander's willing to entertain it. But it's got to work. Uh, and then it, you may think it's going to work, but we're going we're gonna to take it, take it out and try and break it. Because paratroopers are really good at breaking stuff whether that's in training or whether that's in combat. We'll take it out and put it through its paces and give you some feedback. And that'll help just evolve the process and evolve the technology. Uh, and then we'll get it back into the modernization enterprise to, to let it become a program or record, something that we do use not only in the core, but scale it across the Army and, and really across the joint force. Because as we talked about is the importance of, of that uh, seamless interoperability between us and our joint partners and take it to the next level uh, our, our combined partners, so partners and allies that we're going to uh, fight with anywhere in the globe. Very good. Well, uh, General Brown, uh, to all of our uh, AUSA family, uh, thank you very much for, for this uh, very, uh, very informative panel, uh, America's Corps. Let me, one last survey. Raise your hand if you're not a member of the Association of the United States Army. Ra raise your hand. Okay. Well, if you bump into anyone who is not a member, please tell them to go to uh, booth 300, as General Brown has been gracious enough to, to offer a membership at no charge. And so I can't tell you how important it is that we as a family uh, support the association because the association supports panels such as this that provides information and education, voice for the Army and support for the soldier. Let's have a round of applause for this magnificent panel. Well, th thank you, General Anderson. Thanks for keeping us motivated throughout, throughout the panel. What a phenomenal panel. I tell you, you know, if, the, if you didn't think the Army is an innovative organization, I think this panel just, is just proved you wrong. So thanks again to our panel members. Uh, we're going to take a short 30-minute break. Please be back in your seats at 1430. The Sergeant Major of the Army, uh, Michael Grinston, will be uh, providing a keynote address. So be back uh, at 1430, please. Thank you.